Oof. Long day. Go Sox, baby! Let's do this! Oh, it's been a long day, but it's finally game time. Ooh. It's probably snack time as well. Let's rectify this right now. come from huh dude it's been a long day you just want to watch the game yeah well I'm wicked tired too and that was my spot what I don't think so there are a lot of chairs around all right just pull up another seat and enjoy yourself <sighs> well can I at least trade you some of these chips for that cheese chips for cheese chips for cheese huh huh yeah Oh yeah, sure. I'll trade you some. Well, I might as well make a quesadilla then. Hey! Where'd all the beans go? What the? How? Mm. Wow. Oh hey ma'am. These tips are perfect for these nachos I was saving up for. And uh... I took the liberty of building you a couch out of all the other resources I was hanging on to. Sometimes you gotta upgrade, you know? Mm. Wanna get into this? Hello everyone and welcome to Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. Yes, finally a new episode. Welcome, welcome. So oftentimes in schools, educators turn to so-called educational games to try and spice up what's going on in their classrooms. And as we learned in an earlier episode of Engage, many of those so-called educational games really amount to nothing more than just chocolate-covered broccoli. What? And that's just disgusting. What's ironic is that we're in the midst of a tabletop gaming renaissance where there are boatloads of amazing experiences out there handcrafted, specifically designed to bring people together either in a competitive or a cooperative fashion to face conflict and different kinds of challenges in an authentic and meaningful way. It's an amazing thing that we as human beings are able to do when we engage in playing in a game is agree to transport one another to a safe, agreed upon space where we have to follow certain rules and adhere to certain obstacles, but we agree to participate in the space that we create together to resolve different challenges. And really, in the classroom, that's, as educators, it's exactly what we want to have for our students. We want to present them with authentic learning experiences where they need to grapple with different kinds of challenges, either individually or cooperatively, and figure out ways to overcome those challenges in practical and meaningful ways and to put their skills to the test and see what they can do. So why not leverage those experiences that are handcrafted for that purpose? Why why reinvent the wheel? Let's start things off with a game that's become almost as much of a household name as Chess and Checkers in the past decade or so. A game that might as well be the photo next to the dictionary definition of Euro game. The Settlers of Catan. For those of you not yet familiar, Settlers of Catan is a game in which two to four players take on the role of intrepid explorers who have discovered this uncharted territory at coincidentally the exact same time. And independent of each other, each group of explorers ventures out to conquer this new land and take it for themselves, and they soon discover they've got company. Designed by Klaus Tuber in 1994, Settlers of Catan has become a household name in a tabletop gaming phenomena that has tons of expansions and even standalone variations that are entirely separate games all on their own, even one extending into the Game of Thrones universe. Heck, they even have a chocolate version, which I wouldn't recommend getting because it probably won't last that long in your classroom. Hey, I wanted some of that. Sorry, man. 
I haven't eaten all day. You know, teachers don't get that much of a lunch break, all right? Now in this episode of Engage, we will be looking at the base game of Settlers of Catan, which is a fairly simple game to pick up and play. I'll be providing a link in the description below to the official Settlers of Catan website so you can take a look at the full rules before you break out the game if you wish, but in this episode we'll be covering the basic highlights in order to get you started with facilitating a learning through play experience in your classroom effectively. Now, when the average person hears the term board game, the image of a single piece board from the likes of Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers classics like Clue or Risk or Monopoly is probably what comes to mind first, but Settlers of Catan is not like those games. Now you see, Settlers of Catan is a Euro-style game, and in many cases for Euro-style games, that means a customizable game space as you see here, which leads to a greater degree of variability and consequently replayability. As you set up Catan, you're going to start off like we have here with the ocean, and there are numbers on the edges of these pieces to help you figure out which one to connect to what. And then after you're done with this, you're going to start laying out these hexes, which correspond to the different resources that you're all going to be competing through the game. And you're just going to create your island by spreading them out all over the place. This is what you're going to do. Not quite like this, but you know what I mean. The designer does offer a suggested setup for beginners, but you don't need to stick to that. Instead, let your students craft whatever island of Catan they wish, but for their very first game, recommend that they put the desert space smack dab in the middle. From there, lay out the numbered circle pieces on any space except the desert, and place our good friend the robber on that space. We'll get to that scoundrel later. You'll also find these seaport pieces in the box, but you can put them right back where you found them because you're not going to need them. Next, we will move on to player setup. Players will start out with a pair of settlements, each of which will be accompanied by a single road that will represent the path your explorer uses to venture out bravely towards new lands to cultivate. When placed in the game space, each player's settlement must be positioned at the intersections of hexboard pieces. Settlements can be positioned along the periphery by the ocean side as well, but settlements must be more than just one road apart from one another. Now, I have found in my experience in introducing this game with students as young as at the fourth grade level that this is really the only part of the initial setup where students sometimes get a little confused, so you want to be sure to model this part of the setup with your class when introducing this game for the first time. Players take turns rolling the dice to see who gets to place their initial settlements first. The player with the highest number then places only one of their settlements and a single road to go along with it. Carry on until you get to the player who had rolled the lowest number. This player will get to place their first initial settlement and road, and then immediately get to place their second settlement and road. The player who had rolled the second lowest number then gets to place their second initial settlement and road, and you will carry around the table in that reverse order until you get back to the player who started it all. This is commonly referred to as a snake draft, and implementing this mechanic helps to balance the game as changing the order of how the second initial settlements and roads are placed helps to offset the advantage that the player who had rolled the highest number gained since they had the unique opportunity to stake their claim first before anyone else. After each player places their second settlement, each player will retrieve the resources that correspond to the hexes of land that only the second settlement is touching. Now chances are pretty good that you're going to have students in your class that have never played a game quite like Settlers of Catan before. So during this initial setup phase, you'll want to encourage your students to really think carefully about where they're placing their initial two settlements because the last thing you want is for them to have the experience of getting boxed in at the beginning of the game. You may also want to encourage students to take a good hard look at that building cost card before they start placing anything and think about what sort of buildings or roads do they want to build or do they want to go for the development cards first. You want maybe to encourage students who have never played this game before to place their settlements in places that will grant them access to all five of the resources from the start of the game. Or if somebody is looking to take advantage of trading early on, which we'll get into later, they might want to put their settlements on places that have the same resources so they become the baron of those resources 
and that puts them in high demand for trading. Or if such a configuration is available, if they want to go for a development card early in the game, they would want to put their second settlement on the wheat, iron, and sheep. Or maybe they want to go for the longest road right off the bat, or at least have a head start in being able to expand out into the land of Catan from the beginning. They'll want to place their second settlement where they'll get wood and brick if that's available, because that will get you a road. Experienced players might opt to go and put one of their settlements as they're starting out on a seaport, so that will also strengthen their trading mechanic, which we'll get to later. I wouldn't recommend doing that strategy for players who have never touched this game before and they're really starting out fresh, but it's a strategy you could pursue. There's a lot of different options here, and the point is, again, to encourage students who have never played the game before to really think carefully about where they put those initial two settlements so that that way they won't box themselves in from the very start of the game because that could be a frustrating experience and we don't want this game to be frustrating. We want this game to be engaging and exciting. Now you're ready to start playing the game. Starting with the player who had rolled the highest number before, each player will take turns rolling the dice. The hex spaces that match the number that is rolled on the board will then produce a single resource of its type for any player lucky enough to have a settlement along that hex. The player that rolled the dice then has a few options to consider before concluding their turn. They can expand their conquest of Catan by constructing new roads and settlements, and you can build as much as you are able. The active player also has the option to upgrade an existing settlement into a city, and cities produce double the amount of resources that settlements do. The third option for an active player is they may elect to purchase a development card. Development cards can yield points as rewards for enriching your settled communities with libraries, universities, and more. Development cards might also help you to obtain resources that you may may be finding really tough to get at the moment due to the limitations of your initial settlement placement. Development cards may also aid you in recruiting knights to form an army to defend your lands. There is no combat involved in the base game of Settlers of Catan between players. Instead, these brave warriors may help you earn the coveted largest army bonus if you recruit more knights than any other player. Knights also help you chase off the robber, which we will get to later. It is vital to note that when a player is ready to play their hardened sheep and wheat and iron to purchase a development card, they may look at whatever development card they purchased, but they may not play it immediately. That has to wait until the player's next turn. However, you may stock up on as many development cards as you like, and there's no obligation at any point to play them. It's not like you have to play them. So let's say I had purchased these on previous turns. I could go ahead if I had not played a development card yet and play it right now now, and I could play it even before I roll the dice if it was the very beginning of my turn. But I cannot play a development card that I just purchased. Now, unless you happen to get really lucky during the initial setup of the game and claim spots that will be eligible to yield all types of Catan's available resources, you will otherwise immediately find yourself tied to lands that promise to be plentiful for a few select kinds of resources, leaving the rest hard to come by. Thus, you are organically motivated to expand your reach, but if you lack the capability to produce the resources you need in order to build new roads and settlements, what will you do? This brings us to the mechanic that's at the very heart and soul of Settlers of Catan that makes it such a brilliantly devious game, and that is trading. During my turn, I could broker a deal with another player to exchange some resources from my hand for some of theirs, and this is especially helpful if I am in a place where I'm not able to get that kind of resource, or if I don't have access to a seaport to trade at a better cost than I would for the bank, because to the bank, I'd have to pay four of a kind of one resource just to get some other kind of resource that maybe I just don't have right now, but that's quite a hefty price to pay. I do also have the option, if I'm lucky enough, to make my way to a seaport to be able to trade with the mariners at a better rate than the four to one standard with the bank, but really the best route to take is to trade with the other players, and that's what really makes you feel the competition over those resources and how intense that can be. Now, if a player rolls a 7, that roll does not produce new resources for anyone. Instead, a 7 activates the robber. To represent the robber pillaging the land, every player who has more than 7 cards in their hand must discard half of what they have rounded up. After that, the player that activated the robber must move the robber to a hex space that it does not already occupy. 
If the rabber is placed on a hex adjacent to the settlements of other players, the active player can then assume the role of the rabber and steal one card from the opponent of their choice. From this point on, the rabber will steal any new resources produced by the hex base it currently occupies until the rabber is either chased away by someone playing a knight development card or someone else rolls a 7. Players should recall here that no one may play a development card on the same turn that it was purchased. However, if a robber has been terrorizing your land and you have a knight already in your hand, you may play it at any time even before you roll the dice to chase the robber away to somebody else's land to pillage what they've got. If you happen to roll a 7 after that, the robber gets moved a second time and players must follow the discard rule that we discussed earlier. So, why play Settlers of Catan in school? Well, if you're in a humanities class and you're exploring the overarching idea that limited resources creates competition, boom, there you go. That is exactly all that Settlers of Catan is all about. And teachers will take comfort in the fact that this game explores that overarching concept in a nonviolent way. Conflict will ensue in the game as players encroach in each other's space as they start to expand their territory, but there's no combat in the base game, so players will, won't come to blows or unleash wars against each other, but there will be some conflict to resolve or to discuss in a reflection following playing the game. And the only casualty really that may ensue is the loss of friendship if a player takes the game a little too seriously. Now, the best way to implement the use of Settlers of Catan in a unit of curricula such as that in a humanities class is to introduce the game with a flourish of surprise. Don't talk anything about what the unit is going to be about, just introduce this game, teach your students about how to play it, but plant the idea that you will want them to reflect about their experience afterwards, as it will have something to do, of course, with what you're about to learn in class. Then when you gather for your reflection afterwards, you can pose questions about what it was like to be vying for control of the land and vying for control of different resources? What was it like to be that one player who sought to trade aggressively? What was it like to be that player who didn't get to trade at all? What happens if you were to start in a new land with a certain type of resource and without access to others? How does that affect your livelihood? How does that relate to what you deal with on a daily basis? These are all questions you would want your students to be able to reflect about. And after playing the game, you might not even have to ask ask these questions explicitly, they might just come naturally out of your student's reflection about this amazing experience. And Settlers of Catan is surely not the only game to deal with resource management out there, but it is, as I said before, practically a household name, much like chess and checkers these days. It is easy to pick up and play, and readily available, so why not take advantage of it? Settlers of Catan is also a terrific game to leverage in a math class where students are learning about probability and statistics for the first time. Eagle-eyed viewers earlier when we were discussing rules and setup of the game may have noticed that there are numbers from 2 to 12 all across the board but there was no number 7. And of course the number 7 activates the robber. This presents a terrific opportunity for a math teacher to ask their class, why do you think the game designer picked 7 of all the numbers to activate the robber? What's so special? about that. This leads students to the discovery of standard deviation and how that works. They might suspect or they might have heard before that rolling a 7 is the most likely number to roll with two dice. Now is a great opportunity to challenge those students to prove it. It is highly likely as you're going over the rules and how to play the game that your students will notice that there are certain numbers colored in red or there are dots on all of the numbered pieces for some reason. Some particularly eagle-eyed students might even notice there only happens to be one, two, and one, twelve. Why is that? Why do the other numbers appear twice but those numbers only appear once? Factoring all those different pieces together, those are all part of the DNA of how Catan works and how standard deviation works. And once your students piece those different pieces of that puzzle together, then you can ask them, of course, to reflect upon the next time they play this game, how knowledge of standard deviation might affect their strategy moving forward if they were to go to play this game again. 
So, as you can see, we don't need any chocolate-covered broccoli edutainment. We don't need hokey gimmicks dressed up to imitate fun and engaging experiences. We've got plenty of experiences out there to choose from, and Settlers of Catan is just but one of those examples of great game design that teachers can leverage in their classroom to facilitate authentic learning experiences. In the description below, you can find the Common Core and SD Media Literacy Standards for Students aligned with the activities that were described in this episode. Actually, tell you what, we'll throw it up on the screen for you too. <sighs> Alright, I'm back. What's the score? I don't know, man. I don't feel so good. Where's your bathroom? Yeah, it's around the corner down the hall. Okay. Uh, uh. Hey, man, you got any toilet paper? Uh, sure do, boss, but, uh, what are you gonna trade me for it, huh? Oh, come on! Thanks for watching, everybody. I want to give a special thanks to the musicians that granted me permission to use their music as part of this video. Thank you so much, DJ Cutman, Melody Geeks, and Ace Waters. Extra special thanks goes out to Spelling Failure for letting me use Mediocrity as the theme song for this show. If you enjoyed their music, check out links in the description for more. Thank you also to my buddy Jason for serving as Player 2 and the infamous chocolate-covered broccoli hand. I also cannot thank enough everyone who contributed to my GoFundMe campaign to obtain new production equipment for the show to make this brand new episode possible and episodes to come. Please share this video with the hashtag GamesForEd to help promote practical ways to integrate play-based learning and game-based learning in schools today. For more episodes of Engage exploring EduLARP, Transmedia, ARGs, and Practimime, check out the playlist on screen and click the subscribe button to join us in our exploration of more ways to learn through play. Until next time, thanks again for watching and thanks again for sharing the video.